Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning to those of you joining us from across the Pacific region, and good afternoon to those of you joining us from the mainland U.S. and Hawaii. Thanks so much for being with us today for our webinar, Strategies for Aligning K-12 College and Workforce Systems to Ensure Better Jobs for Our Youth. This is the second of two webinars on aligning K-12 college and workforce systems, and if you missed the first one on November 13th, we discussed some of the legislation and context around the need to align these systems, and today we're going to extend that by talking about some strategies for how to address that issue. This webinar can absolutely stand alone if you missed that one, but we're happy to send you the link to the prior webinar if you're interested in hearing that one, too. My name is Kirsten Miller. I am a communications manager at REL Pacific, and I'll be your facilitator today. I'm joined by my colleague, Judy Conley, who will be our technical facilitator today. So if you have any issues with your audio, or if you have any questions about Adobe Connect functionality, please feel free to send Judy a note in the chat box to your right, and we'll do our best to resolve those. Um, and I've learned to say this at webinars because, as you all know, technology doesn't always cooperate. So in the unlikely event that you do get completely disconnected, please just dial back in using the instructions that I sent to you via email, and we should be able to get you back up and running. We are recording today's webinar again for future reference and for you to share with your colleagues or if you have a conflict that requires you to jump offline early today. And you can use that chat box to your right also to ask questions or to make observations throughout the webinar. We'll hold uh, questions for breaks in the presentation, but we will do our best to get to any questions and comments during our time together today. And we're also happy to take follow-up questions and continue the conversation later over email. So we're also joined today again by our presenter, Dr. Louise Yarnall, a senior research social scientist in SRI International's Center for Technology and Learning. For those of you who were with us earlier this month, she really needs no introduction, but for those of us joining for the first time today, um, I'd like to tell you a bit about her and why we're so happy to have her with us as our presenter today. Dr. Yarnall specializes in community college education research, assessment design, evaluation, scaling of classroom, innovative instructional and assessment practices, and journalism education research. Her community college education research focuses on workforce education, general education and developmental education, and that includes analysis and development of online communities to support professional development for faculty. She also analyzes video-based and e-portfolio records, um, also uh, faculty classroom instruction and assessment practices, and designs and develops web tools to support faculty to create formative and summative classroom assessments. As you can tell, she's worked really closely with community college educators across a variety of fields and contexts, and we're thrilled to have her with us again today. And now that you know a little bit about us, we'd like to know a little bit about you. So I'm going to ask Judy to pull up a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. We're asking you to choose the role that corresponds to what you do, and if you do choose other, you'll see that you have a little box right there below the poll where you can type in your response and let us know what your job role is. Um, we'd like to do that at the start of our webinars so we can get a sense of your context and we can adjust our content as appropriate. Now we're going to go back to our presentation slides, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about RHEL Pacific and the work that we're engaged in, and specifically give you a little bit of grounding in some of the work that we're doing in the area of alignment. So RHEL Pacific at McCrell International is one of 10 regional educational laboratories funded by the Institute of Education Sciences, or IES, at the U.S. Department of Education. Our current contract cycle runs from 2017 to the beginning of 2022, and we serve seven state and nation-level jurisdictions. Those are American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the the Federated States of Micronesia, which includes Chuuk, Koshrai, Ponape, and Yap, and then also Guam, the state of Hawaii, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. So as you can see from this map that I'm pulling up, our region is geographically very vast. It spans an area that's larger than that of the entire continental United States, and it's also linguistically and culturally very diverse, which we'll touch on um, a little bit more in just a few minutes. Our work focuses on four priority areas college and career readiness and success, which we're talking about today, early childhood education and school readiness, teacher professional learning, and issues in specific cultural education. So we initially began our work around college and career readiness and systems alignment under the last real contract cycle, which we held from 2012 just into the beginning of 2017 when this uh, latest cycle started. And our work is structured around researcher practitioner alliances and partnerships. So again, we're going to ground our conversation today in an example from the CNMI Alliance for College and Career Readiness and Success. But I do want to stress 
However, for those of you joining us from outside of the Pacific region, that this information really is applicable to a wide variety of contexts. Again, we work within this very geographically, linguistically, culturally diverse region. I know some of your contexts are similar, so you'll see connections to your context and to your work, whether, for example, you're working in a rural area or whether your context has a large concentration of English language learners and so forth. So the CNMI Alliance is made up of members from the K-12 public school system, the local college, Northern Marianas College, and the CNMI Department of Labor. And it's really the first of its kind within the CNMI in that it brings together representatives from K-12 and college and career systems. As we focus on this idea of alignment today, we're going to continue to bring in examples from this alliance. And really the overarching kind of galvanizing idea of this alliance has been to support that type of collaboration that we're talking about today among K-12 college and career systems. Over the last five years, the partnership has really focused on helping more of their students be ready for and successful in college and career through continued collaboration, again, between the K-12 college and career settings. And they've used research results, data, and evidence-based strategies to guide policy and practice to increase college, career, and life readiness and success in the CNMI. And some of the work they've done so far has been to examine indicators of college and career readiness. Um, they've examined national indicators. They've identified their own local indicators. And they've um, actually generated a local definition of college and career readiness for the CNMI and have examined and implemented some nationally used approaches to address college and career readiness. So that's just a really high-level look at the work of the CNMI Alliance. And again, we're going to weave that back in as an example throughout Louise's presentation. We have two parts to our agenda today. Part one, what does the research say? So we'll talk about career exploration activities, contextualized lesson activities, and capstone experiences, including project-based or inquiry-based learning, and also internships and apprenticeships. And part two is about aligning K-12 college, or excuse me, aligning K-12 education experiences and the needs of college and the workforce. So we'll talk about how you align those experiences and the kinds of decisions you'll need to make about career-aligned curriculum and instructional strategies that will work for you. So that's the focus of our time together today. And it is now my pleasure to hand the presentation over to Dr. Louise Yarnall. So Louise, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Kirsten, for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be with everyone today and glad that so many of you are interested in learning about this research into career-aligned curriculum activities and their efficacy for preparing students for college and career. I want this to be an informative session, and um, I really want to encourage your questions uh, later in the webinar. Uh, I'm going to begin by discussing the research into effective ways to support learning and uh, student outcomes with career aligned curriculum, and I will discuss three types of career aligned curriculum, as you saw in the earlier slide, career exploration activities, contextualized lesson activities, and capstone experiences. And also to frame this uh, whole presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about history. You know, the emphasis on career-oriented learning has waxed and waned over the past 40 years in American education. There was an openness to it in the 1960s and 1970s in American K-12 education, but there has been a kind of a long cooling period that started, uh, I would date it back to the mid-1980s. Um, at that time, career education began to face a kind of resistance and declining emphasis and funding. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are many reasons for this. I, I think one of the uh, based on my reading, one of the key inputs at the time was the focus on quality and rigor in American K-12 education um, with that really uh, laser focus on improving academic quality and access. Um, there was a critique that emerged around vocational education programming as sort of promoting inequity of access to high quality education. Um, and in this discussion, in this critique, um, vocational education was kind of framed as a second-class type of educational program to which students of color and low-income students were disproportionately uh, directed. And, you know, as we saw, though, in the first webinar in this series, there have been some fundamental changes in the needs of employers, the structure of the workforce, and sort of challenges, on persistent challenges, to kind of a narrowly academic approach in K-12 education. And so career-aligned instruction um, 
and curriculum is starting to get a new look. Um, and policymakers have sort of revised their framing of those kinds of activities. So today, career-aligned program, programming is seen as a useful way to motivate rigorous K-12 academic learning and also as a way to better prepare all students to compete in this global, high-tech workforce. And because of these sort of trends that I just described historically, a good portion of the research that I'm going to review comes from literature focused not so much on K-12, but from post-secondary education as well as um, organizational industrial education literature. Um, but where possible, I do cite some of the pioneering work in K-12 career-aligned education, and I wanted to give a shout out to my SRI international colleagues, Reggie Stites and Mia Warner, who are two of the lead uh, researchers on the evaluation of the Linked Learning Initiative, um, and that's uh, career academies. That's the name for a, a whole chain of career academies. And their work provides many insights into the implementation and challenges um, in career, in delivering uh, career-aligned curriculum and instruction, and also some possible solutions. So I'll sprinkle some of that in <laughs> throughout my uh, presentation here. And so as I discuss each of the career-aligned instructional strategies, I'm going to discuss them in the same way. Um, I'm going to have sort of uh, five elements that I'm going to touch on, and I want to just briefly review those. So first, I'm going to provide a definition uh, for whatever the strategy is from the research literature. Second, I will discuss the rationale for implementing it, and that also kind of comes from the literature. And third, I'll describe the core elements of the strategy. How do you teach it? You know, how do you design a curriculum? What goes into the mix? And fourth, I'll provide supporting research evidence into the efficacy of the curriculum. And finally, I'll provide an example or illustration of the curriculum in action and um, where I have some uh, you know, research on implementation challenges and solutions, I'll mention that too. So after each curriculum strategy, um, I will pause for questions and comments. So strategy number one, career exploration activities. Um, in the literature, career exploration activities are defined as those that afford K-12 students access to new information, um, something they did not know about in the past, about potential occupations, jobs, and organizations that offer career opportunities. And the purpose of the career exploration is to support learners in making decisions about their um, future careers and plan next steps in their career journeys. And I wanted to also just expand on this a bit. You know, career exploration is seen as a set of behaviors and understandings um, that raise a learner's awareness of what they could do or be in the future. And doing it well um, involves knowing where to explore such information, how to explore such information, how much to explore it, and also what types of information you'll target you know, for um, your career exploration. And I wanted to also emphasize um, something about this career exploration process. It should be viewed as moving in two directions at the same time. There's an inward movement where you kind of you find out, the, the learner finds out what um, she wants and and how uh, she feels about different career options. This is sort of the introspective movement. And then there's an outward uh, focus, you know, to find out about the sorts of opportunities out there that might align with um, a learner's inner desires, talents, and needs. Now, the process does vary, right, in how it progresses. Um, and it's just something to keep in mind um, if you're contemplating presenting this and engaging young people in this. Um, we all know that some folks are kind of very focused very early in their lives, and that focus often also means they're going to be able to find the information they want uh, pretty uh, early and easily. And then others, particularly when you're a teenager, you really might not know, and you might just have a lot of different ideas of what you could do. And um, 
and you'll find that experience stressful. And uh, you may even withdraw from it. So depending on how one kind of assesses uh, the, how it's going, and um, like you may look at, like when you go to that external part and you're looking at, well, are there jobs in the field of my dreams, right? You'll see some variation there too. Like someone with really high self-esteem and confidence in their talents and their abilities and all of the social capital they have, um, they might go ahead and, and roll the dice and enter a really competitive field that has low labor market demand, like you know acting or something, while um, another individual with kind of a low sense of all those factors may feel some doubts, even about entering a field that has you know, a lot of demand. I mean, they're hiring a lot of folks. So just keep those sort of dynamics in mind. And um, as we discussed in the first webinar, the current policymaking approach is to make more learners aware of the high demand fields in their region. And, you know, I, I got a question in that first webinar, like, okay, let's say we do that, we the educators, and the students don't ultimately go into that field in their adult lives. Have we failed, right? And I really think this is an interesting question. I think it's something that everyone should talk about and, and think about. Um, for me, I actually take a position on this, which I'll share with you. And I think that given how young folks are in high school, I think there's value to learning about these fields in this way um, even if they, and I think there's value to it, even if they don't ultimately go into that field. I think they get a chance to see what they like, what they don't like. They um, may even find another niche in that field, like um, someone who's in the allied health program may discover, you know, I'm really not into direct patient care. But that same learner may discover other opportunities in that industry, like, you know, maybe information technology in a hospital or media relations, or maybe even being an actuary, something like that. So um, I think it's all good, and I think it's all valuable. So why do this, right? And the primary reason for including career exploration activities in the K-12 curriculum focuses on one of those structural trends that um, we discussed in the first webinar, um, and that is the um, unpredictability of the labor market. It really in underscores the importance of developing a kind of career adaptability, if you will, in, in, in youth. And, um, you know, in all likelihood, your students are going to need to change careers and upgrade their skills throughout their lives. And so the, any foundation that educators can provide now to support career exploration will be really helpful and I think will be something that they, these young people go back to throughout their lives. Um, so what does it involve? Um, it, it involves things like the following. It gets young people thinking about their future, making their own career decisions, exploring vocational opportunities, and developing more confidence in, in coping with the challenges of envisioning, you know, what can I do in, in the grown-up world, so to speak. So now I'll, I'll turn to the elements of career exploration activities. You know, many of us are familiar with career exploration activities in our own lives. Like some of us have worked with career counselors. Um, now, what are the core elements that distinguish, you know, career exploration activities? You know, typically it involves engaging students individually or in small groups and reflecting on their personal values, their sense of what they can do or be, a, maybe developing a general long-term plan of what they want to do or even uh, just coming up with a near-term plan, like the steps that you need to implement in that long-term plan, okay? And I want to just draw your attention. These first two bullets uh, really focus on that internal kind of reflection type of activity, and the second two bullets really kind of involve that external looking and facing research kind of activity, maybe into the labor market and occupations and companies where a student might consider working. Now I'm going to talk about the evidence for this strategy. And I'm going to start by uh, citing the um, work by um, um, some MDRC colleagues. Um, they looked at the National, National Longitudinal Survey of Youth um, 
from uh, in 1997, and it was quite a, a large study. Um, and they, they looked at the impacts of career exploration activities on two outcomes, the likelihood of, well, actually more than two, uh, likelihood of graduating high school and going to college or professional training, uh, taking AP classes, those sorts of things. And um, they found that, in general, it had very positive impacts um, and that um, you know, on these two kinds of outcomes. And they also got some descriptive data that really described um, you know, what the growth of career exploration activities um, just between 1997 and 2000. And so I'll just give you some of those numbers. Um, like in 1997, they only had 38% of all students uh, reporting that they participated in career exploration activities in high school. And by 2000, that went up to 53%. Um, high school students who were reporting career majors in high school went from 19% in 1997 to nearly a third, 31% in 2000. Um, and the, there was a doubling or a near doubling of the number of high school students reporting that they participated in internships and mentoring activities. Um, and then job shadowing also increased a little bit from 13% to 20%. So, um, you know, that was back then, and I don't have more recent data, but given the growth in the number of high schools focusing on these kinds of activities, I would expect that that probably has just continued to, to increase. And back then, uh, most of the growth was among students attending vocational schools um, and the growth in the more comprehensive traditional high school was, was a little more modest, but um, it was also, you know, growing. And um, the other really good news is when I talked earlier about um, the old style vocational education critique and particularly the notion that, you know, the, uh, only the sort of low income and uh, underrepresented minority students would get directed to those kinds of activities. When it comes to career exploration activities, they found a very, um, it was very um, consistent in participation between uh, the, the affluent students and the high poverty students and the A and B students and the C and D students and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then one of the things that they did that was kind of neat in this study is they estimated a model um, to sort of take a, a, a student, um, in this case a, a minority student from a low-income family in an urban area who is getting poor to, to average grades, right? Now what would happen to that student um, if he or she participated in career exploration activities in high school um, versus if, if he or she didn't uh, with respect to these outcomes like graduation and going to college? Well, big, big difference. I mean, um, if he or she participated in those activities, he or she would have a 72% probability of graduating high school compared to 52% if not participating in those. And it was similar, similarly kind of um, noticeable with the college attendance uh, model where, you know, uh, the, the, that student would have a 24% probability if taking career exploration activities compared to only 15% if not. So there's something there that's uh, saying there's, there's an association there um, between participating in these activities in high school and these kinds of uh, traditional success indicators. Um, and the other uh, evidence that I found, um, you know, other studies showed significant positive impacts of when you feel more socially and academically integrated into college, um, you may feel more efficacious in planning your career and completing vocational tasks. So that was one study. And, um, and then um, another uh, study here um, showed significant outcomes from participating in career exploration on some of the, you know, the skills associated with, you know, making good decisions, feeling like you can make good career decisions, having clear career goals, and just an improved sense of self-efficacy in whatever the, the field is that you want to enter. 
Um, so these are all sort of positive um, um, indicators from career exploration. So now I'm going to share some examples of um, these activities. And it could be something as simple as reviewing lists of possible careers and jobs. It could be participating in mock job interviews. And we have some other activities, too, that they were studying um, and have been studied. You know, sequ you know, taking a sequence of courses in a career-related major, um, like you would have at a career academy. Uh, cooperative education participation, where you, you know, attend school part of the day, and then you will go work somewhere for another part of the day. Job shadowing, mentoring, and um, even participating in a school-sponsored business of some sort where you're sort of running it, and then the tech prep um, programs of study. So all of those are classified as career exploration activities. And I wanted to pause now briefly to just see if there are any questions about this first strategy, career exploration. So if you do have any questions, please just go ahead and type those into the chat box to your right. I'll spend uh, a few minutes here monitoring those. And uh, if we have any questions, we'll um, pose those to Louise. And if we don't, we will move on. So let's just give it a minute to see if anybody's putting anything in the chat box. It doesn't look like we have any questions coming up, but we'll keep uh, monitoring that chat box, and we'll get to any questions later in the presentation. So Louise, I think you can move forward. All right. OK. Thanks, Kirsten. OK. So now let's turn to strategy number two, uh, contextualized learning activities. And so first, we start with the, the definition. And um, contextualized learning is an instructional approach connecting foundational academic skills and content to a college major or a career field. Um, it centers on the practice of systematically connecting basic skills instruction to a specific content area that is meaningful and useful to students. So that's the, the working definition. And it's often used uh, typically in college courses, uh, in the literature, uh, college courses that are um, you know, uh, basically, you're going into a job area and you're taking career technical education, and they might integrate some of these practices in that kind of course, or it could be taking place in a remedial or developmental class. Um, you know, and it's it's believed to support um, deeper learning and motivation because it provides specific models of um, how to apply academic skills to problems encountered in the real world, so to speak, or the workplace. And it really gives students a picture of how their academic skills are relevant uh, to the work that they might want to do. And um, typically, what this sort of looks like, uh, one of the classic examples is the IBEST program, the Integrated Basic Education Skills Training Program, which began in Washington State and has now been extended to other states. And some of you in the audience may be familiar with IBEST. Um, typically, it involves a partnership in the lesson design and delivery um, between a specialist in the basic content matter, and it could be mathematics or uh, English language arts, um, and a specialist in the academic or technical field. Um, and often, like in the IBEST model, the students actually work with two teachers in the classroom, and you know one would provide this sort of uh, a specialized job or um, academic. A focus like the history class or the biology class, and the other would teach the basic skills um, like reading, math, or ELA. Um, and so the general expectation, though, is that the, the instructors are going to be really fluid, if you will, uh, between those two kinds of roles in these, in these courses. Um, and so now let me talk about the elements of contextualized learning activities. Um, some of the things you might see uh, like the Columbia University researcher Dolores Perrin has differentiated between two types of contextualization instructional strategies. Um, you know, it, it could include like contextualized learning, as she defines it, it, it's teaching the basics against a backdrop of, speci of a specific type of subject matter. And so that would be, you know, contextualized learning as embedded in the remedial class. Um, or it could be 
something she calls integrated learning, or um, integrated writing, or integrated reading, what have you, integrated learning. And it's really designing academic, technical, or professional content to include the supports for students to um, increase their proficiency with, on the basics. Um, you can kind of sneak it in on, on that one. Um, now I'll talk about the supporting evidence for this. Um, it, it, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a lot of the work here comes from the college context. So you're going to see uh, in the literature much of it does come from college academic programs and adult basic ed. There is some K-12. Um, and the integrated learning studies um, have see, that also comes from like the career technical education programs in college. And, uh, but there is some secondary education and elementary education uh, for the, this evidence. And the findings, uh, to summarize, um, are, are really pretty positive. Uh, students learn significantly more relative to controls in these, in these various studies. And um, the, the thing that they found is this collaboration activity that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the faculty collaborating across subjects and so on, and even grade levels. There's some evidence that this sharing collaboration improves uh, curriculum alignment, which in turn seems to be associated with uh, students um, doing better on some of these academic uh, test outcomes. And um, that, by the way, that uh, citation there was the Bloom et al. and the Weiss uh, Vischer uh, et al. Uh, work. And um, let me give you just some quick examples. I'll give you a few of these here. So in a reading class, it might be as simple as changing the subject of a reading text to be something career related. Um, so, and you might be reading genres that you would find normally in the workplace, like a newsletter or maybe even a procedural manual, something like that. And, um, you know, another example is in mathematics class, you would involve the students using, um, you know, gathering data and interpreting it and representing it. Um, in, from career-related topics and maybe even current school business topics. So in one case, um, students were doing, they were selecting a pizza vendor and they were analyzing some of the data to, to make that recommendation. And in writing class, it engaged, you would engage students in writing office reports and memoranda and things like that. And um, so those are some examples um, of how uh, that that, that looks. Um, so I'll also stop now uh, to just see if there are any questions about this second strategy. So again, if anyone has any questions or comments, just go ahead and type those in the chat box to your right. We'll give it just a few seconds. Okay, so we have a comment from Valric Welch um, that he would like to see more coordination between the academic, cultural, and physical education toward career readiness. Mm, That's something okay. that we could, um, you know, definitely continue conversations uh, around with our REL Pacific staff. And I think that looks like that's it for now, Louise, if you want to keep going. Okay. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just reading uh, on the, I can see what Ballwick wrote. Is that the, the program, was there a program involved with that, Kirsten? I, Oh, it does look like, like Valric was referencing the 500 sales program as something that we should take a look at. And there's a link there for everybody on the uh, webinar. You can go ahead and click on that live link. And it looks like we can get that information there. Thank you for that. OK. OK, good. Well, thank you very much. And now we'll move to strategy number three, um, capstone experiences. And um, I group them two different kinds of instructional strategies uh, under capstone, uh, problem-based learning and internships and apprenticeships. And um, you know, both of these are typically offered at the end of a course or an academic term. So that's why I've kind of um, named them that. Uh, but you know, obviously, you don't have to put it nearly uh, always at the end. Um, but the notion is that in problem-based learning, um, let's go to the definition. Uh, first for problem-based learning, that students conduct research, integrate theory and practice, and apply knowledge and skills to develop a viable solution to a defined problem. Now, 
what I wanted to underscore there, like why am I putting this under capstone, typically in these two methods, you're doing a lot of applied um, activity. And implicit in that is the notion that you're uh, not just learning one thing at a time, but you're applying a lot of different kinds of knowledge and skill uh, simultaneously. And so that's why it's typically um, part of the capstone. Um, so that's the definition uh, that we're going to work with here. And now I wanted to talk about well, rationale. So why do it? Um, and many people in the audience might be familiar. Maybe many of you have tried to do problem-based learning in your classrooms. Um, I know we have a lot of researchers on the line, but um, you know it's, it's a very challenging way to teach. Um, but the rationale is that it is uh, viewed as providing value not only as a way to deepen learners' knowledge and skills around content, but it's also supposed to involve them in developing some other competencies, like interpersonal competencies, such as communication and teamwork, and what I sometimes call intrapersonal competencies, like I'm managing my own time and my own emotions, and I'm managing my own uh, learning trajectory, so I call those intrapersonal. But these are also expected to be improved um, through this method. Um, but I wanted to talk about the expectations for the students and the teachers um, in this kind of uh, instructional approach. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that it kind of turns the traditional instructor-student relationship a little bit on its head. I mean, the students are typically involved in developing you know, the solutions on their own or to a great extent on their own with just sort of coaching or facilitation by the instructor. Um, and the student's work is often not only rated on its correctness and, you know, in terms of applying the academic or technical knowledge and skills, uh, you know, accurately, but according to how well the work process itself kind of unfolds, like are the teams, you know, reaching sound decisions, are they distributing the work well, uh, are they playing well, if you will? Um, and then also things that really matter in the real world, like how do they justify their solution, right? Are they um, appealing to you know, the kinds of con concerns uh, of their audience? Um, you know, so those are the kinds of things. It's not just getting it right. Um, and students are really expected to be kind of very much self-starters, so you're starting to maybe sense why this is a powerful way to learn uh, in a career-aligned way. Um, you're not just kind of going through the motions because the teacher told you to. You're supposed to be kind of committed and enthused and using your imagination. Um, often you're working very closely with your peers. Um, it's not like you're going to be cheating or viewed as cheating if you, which is often the case in, in a school context. Um, in this case, you really want to be helping people on your team and so forth. Um, and then the instructors, again, that facilitator role, uh, the idea is give the students a lot of material to, to, to be able to proceed on their own with a good amount of independence, which means give them some en enticing starting points for, for these problems that they might want to solve. Um, and then be welcoming to multiple solutions. Um, there are many ways often to, to solve these kinds of problems. And so what are the elements instructionally? So helping to select the problem, as I mentioned, giving them that menu, um, suggesting relevant learning resources, um, modeling reasoning approaches, not giving them the answer, but sort of showing how they might arrive at an answer. Um, asking really good questions that might stimulate them to get unstuck if, if the team is getting stuck on something. Don't just say, do it this way. Um, sort of say, and I wonder. I wonder about this, or have you tried maybe looking at it this way? That, that kind of questioning is really powerful in, in problem-based learning. And providing, you know, again, useful information uh, and tools and guidelines for the, the, the small stuff, if you will. If they're getting stuck on oh, how does this computer program work? You know, you don't want them to get too stuck on that sort of tool if that's not the focus of the uh, learning. So try to make that stuff easy. And sometimes you need to encourage students who maybe have been so 
trained, if you will, uh, you know, to competing when they're in school, uh, you know, encourage them to rely on each other. Um, and uh, also when students will be asked to assess one another, you know, be, don't be afraid like, oh, I don't want to give you a bad grade, I want to tell on you with the teacher, but it's like, like no, I, I want to help you get better at what you're doing um, in that sort of collegial sense, like the students get a chance to, to feel that and experience that. And then conducting a debrief at the end, that's really important because the students get to reflect on all the things that they learned and that will not just involve the, the content, right, the traditional content, it will involve things like the interpersonal skills, the intrapersonal skills, how could I have planned this better, and that, this sort of thing. And there are some variations to problem-based learning, which I'm sure everyone has heard of to some extent here. There's inquiry-based learning, um, often used in science courses. It begins with a question followed by an investigation, um, and uh, often it, there is a right answer sometimes with this one, like uh, if, especially if it's in school, in science class, often the classic case of this is doing a lab exercise to understand some concept like osmosis, and um, you want to make sure they're understanding what osmosis really is, right? Um, and uh, another variation would be case-based learning, which, um, as it says here, involves learners in maybe looking at a specific case um, it's, it's really to understand and reflect on certain aspects of the case so that they are more prepared in the future. And an example of this would be if you get a group of first responders together and um, they kind of go over how an agency or group of agencies responded to some emergency like a typhoon or something, um, that debriefing process um, is, is very educational. Um, and then the, the third and final variant of problem-based learning is uh, project-based learning. Um, they, they sound very similar, but there is a little subtle distinction. Um, often the project really involves like giving people design constraints, if you will, and they have to come up with a product or a presentation. And um, the classic on this would be building a robot or you know creating something together. Um, and I've seen all of these done in, uh, mostly in my work, community college. Um, so the supporting evidence on this is, is really mixed. Um, it, it, you know, there are some studies out there showing strong positive impacts and then some that not so much. And the uh, sort of speculation on this is that there probably is a wide variation in how instructors understand and enact problem-based learning and how their students engage with it. So as you can see, it's, it's got a lot of room for variation in um, implementation. And so that generally makes things a little tougher to, to measure in a precise way. Um, but there are some studies that I managed to find uh, that uh, suggested um, you know, some positive impacts. And in, in respect to uh, you know, career-related uh, skills. So one study of some post-secondary students um, in engineering class, and this was, I think, in China, um, they showed improved self-efficacy, a sense that I can do this really well um, in that, in this case, the engineering field, the civil engineering field. They felt more that they identified with it. So you can see how it's kind of building that identity, which is so important when you're um, an adolescent, and then also just they have felt like they began to get a sense of a career plan. Now, of course, this was post-secondary students who already were probably signing up to to um, to go into this field. But it's I think there's a little bit of a sense of how that could be relevant to K-12 also. And when they talk to the students, and I'll say more about that later. When we talk to the students, um, when they did, uh, they found that uh, certain instructional elements really foster these kinds of positive feelings about the career. And that was the teamwork, the design experience itself, and then handling um, situations on a, on a sort of a site uh, where they were doing their work. So there's just that sense of handling something real. Um, and so um, I'll, now I'll give you some examples of this uh, approach. 
Um, basically, in, in, you know, one classic case here is provide a challenge problem uh, to students that's drawn from a career setting. So no matter what class you're teaching, um, make sure the problem has that sense of you're working on something. You're, I've heard teachers who do this say, when they're in my class, um, it's, they're, in the, they're working. I tell them that, you know, I'm not the teacher anymore, I am the supervisor, and they are in the, on the work site. Um, so that's sort of the spirit um, of, of bringing this off. And here are some examples, like, that I've seen in community college, you know, when you're setting up a computer network, um, often you have lots of people tapping into it, and you need to uh, go through this very technical process of kind of setting up the uh, computer system so it can, you know, put people in the right place at the right time on the network. So that's a, an interesting, complex process that would take a team to kind of think about and, um, and do together. Um, another example would be, I've seen this in environmental um, uh, science class, um, where, you know, they had to study an environmental problem that was taking place in um, their local region. There were several teams doing different problems. And then they all did this deep research into the problem, and then they each had to prepare and actually go to a city council <laughs> or, you know, some sort of public body to um, present uh, their solution. So, um, and then another one I've seen is creating a website. But, you could imagine, now these came from career technical education courses, but you could imagine doing something like that. Just pick a career problem, maybe a step or two away from what you do in a K-12 class, and uh, you, could, you could do this. Um, and here are some other uh, tips that when um, we've uh, studied it, um, as well as my colleagues uh, who worked on link learning in California, you know, we got a lot of input on what's challenging uh, about teaching with this method and how to kind of deal with those challenges. So one of the things is to set up, I mean, when you're setting up the resources, keep in mind that you need sort of different kinds of resources. So have the step-by-step, -step, have those cheat sheets, if you will, on the really simple stuff, the stuff that you don't want them to get too bogged down on because it's not really central to what they should be learning. So make sure that those step-by-step -step instructions, like how to use the technology, if that's not really what they're, that's not the subject of the class, how to apply some rule or procedure, um, those are really good. And, and the link learning um, team found that um, career technical education coursework was a really common setting for these sort of problem-based learning tasks. Um, and there was a real emphasis in those career academies on um, encouraging students to uh, do real-world tasks. Um, so that's an insight from that, that research. Um, other examples, uh, again, don't just have the basics in those resources. You might also want to have some very advanced um, materials in the resources. And, um, because you want to push the creativity. You want the students to get fired up, you know, and you never know what exactly is going to appeal uh, to the students around this sort of thing. So I've seen people providing um, resources to get students to think about the problem from different perspectives, um, different design approaches, um, you know, and different, you know, maybe different theories uh, if you're doing something more in the science realm. and. Um, in the link learning studies, um, they found that, you know, some of the problems with respect to these kinds of problem-based learning opportunities, and particularly, um, you know, we'll talk more about internships and apprenticeships, equity, equity. It's just who gets to do those, those things? Who gets the, the instructor who's going to do the complex problem-based learning? Who gets to as we'll talk about in a moment, the internship and the apprenticeship, um, you know, sometimes you feel like there's just not enough to go around, and then you wind up sort of saying, okay, well, only that certain students will have access to this. And so one of the solutions that they found was to have um, people who coordinate at the local level 
uh, at the school to reach out to um, you know industry partners and also to get ideas for problem-based learning from the industry partners. Um, that just really helps to make uh, that go better. And um, I think the other thing that they talked about was um, having a pretty clear p pathway. Uh, like, why are you doing this problem-based learning task? Maybe. Um, make it really, give them a picture of the uh, external partners, industry partners, who would be interested in seeing the product of your problem-based uh, activity. And to really drive this home, what I've seen instructors do in many cases, is they'll have a friend. They'll have a friend in that industry, and that person will come in on the day of the presentation and um, you know sit there and kind of review uh, and appreciate what the students have done. And that's, that's very motivating because it's, it's a different audience. It feels different from just you know, handing something into the, uh, the teacher. I won't pause this yet. I'm going to go right into internships and apprenticeships. So um, again, the, the definition uh, on this one is making use of the workplace as a site for teaching and learning. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this. Incorporating work experience into the process of schooling. Um, using learning from work experience to contribute to students' intellectual and career development, and supplementing work experience with school activities that you know, apply, reinforce, refine, or extend work-based learning in order to develop attitudes, knowledge, and skills, and habits that might not develop from the work experience alone. And uh, so there's a lot going on there, and we'll talk more about this. So why? Why do these? And these are becoming very, in the policy world, there's a lot of emphasis right now and funding around apprenticeships. So, so why? Why is everyone looking at this? And I think there's a view, again, uh, going back to the career exploration outcomes, that um, this really helps the students start thinking more about what comes next after school and motivates them and could lead to some really good um, employment outcomes for the graduates, and it develops their professional competencies as well as those interpersonal, social, emotional uh, competencies. They begin to develop a professional network. Um, and then also, it, it, again, in the spirit of the deeper learning um, through application, and also through getting that social support when you go out and, and work in these contexts. So it's just, there's a richness around that applied learning opportunity. And it may involve some of the following elements. Um, it could be a single extended work experience at the end of a course of study, like the classic capstone. Or it could be a series of brief work experiences sort of interspersed throughout the school year and might be at different places or different jobs in the same place, that kind of thing. Um, and typically, if a school environment is going to uh, mount this kind of uh, apprenticeship or internship kind of program, um, it needs to be very structured. There needs to be a process for negotiating um, you know, what you're going to be doing on the internship and how that's going to relate to the knowledge um, that you're learning in school and how it's going to extend that. And typically for assessment, um, it will involve one or more reflections or reports on the work experience. Um, and maybe a reviewer rating by the employer that uh, the teacher can use. And you know, evidence that this works. Um, there was I, I I found one large scale study of Portuguese institutions of higher education, and they uh, looked at um, you know many institutions and a big big data set, and so they estimated a model, um, and they. You know, it, it showed that there was um, a reduction in graduate unemployment by a, a good number um, if they had the mandatory long-term internship. And even if they had those brief work experiences, that also um, reduced graduate unemployment. So that's um, some of the evidence. And um, I wanted to talk. The literature also does put a sort of a spotlight on some of the challenges in, in this uh, space. Um, and I think one of the hardest things that you see, I've seen in a lot of um, articles, is um, just finding enough 
uh, business partners and industry partners who want to to work with you. Um, that, it's just pretty tough because that's not right. It's not their job, um, their, their primary job, and so it requires a kind of um, negotiation with the uh, industry folks. They have to sort of see and appreciate this is worth it. You know, it's worth it for me. It's worth it for the community. It has that kind of feel to it from the business side. But one of the challenges from the educator side on this is, you know, the sense that maybe we have to do anything that the employer wants. We don't want to offend the employer. Employer, you know, it's okay to be able to negotiate it a little bit, um, you know. And again, you'll get that pushback of like, this is I'm very busy um, from industry, and this is not my first, uh, you know, job here. And it's again, it's just building that sense of the discussion about community and supporting the next generation and how you know there will be a benefit to industry for this, but it, it's bigger than that too. Um, and uh, I think there have been concerns about the academic quality uh, maybe suffering or the academic learning and achievement suffering uh, when students do have to they're not just 100% students, right? They're kind of splitting their energies between a work site and a school environment. And so there's a, many articles on that concern. Um, and then I think of obviously that one of the hardest things is uh, everybody, everybody's business is busy, not just the business people, but also the, the teachers are super busy. And so it's just really hard to maintain that bridge. Um, and so um, I wanted to provide some um, examples here. And, and we'll talk a little later about some of the strategies to, to, to make these things work better. Um, but uh, in the uh, examples of K-12 internships and apprenticeships, the big three that I uh, could see in the literature, linked learning, um, which is really at, mostly at the high school level, and then the Ed Visions Cooperative and Big Picture. Actually, they're all at the high school level. Um, and I'm familiar. I have worked on evaluations of Ed Visions and Big Picture years ago. Um, my colleagues did link learning. But these are the things that um, I noticed in all these programs um, they do to make them work. Uh, this, you just, one cannot just expect teachers to just take on an extra bit of work around reaching out to local industry. It's fine if occasionally you can find somebody, but really they need, the schools need to dedicate a school staff member to reach out and maintain those relationships. Um, and then also you need that formal process for finding a work setting of interest, working, doing those negotiations I talked about where you work out the learning goals, and also really make sure those goals are defined in writing and tracked during that work experience, and then do offer an opportunity for presentation and reflection. Those things really help. So I will now stop and, and see if there are any questions or comments about strategy three on capstone experiences. Okay, and again, um, if anyone wants to go ahead and comment or ask a question, just type that into the chat box to your right. We'll give you a few seconds to do that. Doesn't look like anything's coming up just yet, um, but again, please feel free to type into that chat box anytime throughout the presentation, and we can hold those questions until there's a break. So I think, Louise, um, we can go ahead and keep going. Okay. So now I'm going to switch to um, part two, and this is really getting into some of the decisions and uh, about making. Uh, you know, making decisions about what kind of career-aligned curriculum and instructional strategies will work in, in a school context. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous um, webinar, um, I mentioned a three-step approach to um, aligning K-16 education experiences with workforce needs. And um, since this webinar focuses on career-aligned curriculum, I'm going to focus here mainly on um, what I'm going to show you, step three. We, in the previous webinar, we talked a lot about step one and step two. And now we're really going to talk about creating these career-aligned educational experiences. Um, the other two steps focus on gathering information. 
from the outside of the school context about local labor market um, needs and uh, potential uh, institutional partners and competitors and stakeholders. Um, and if you're interested in that and you missed the first webinar, you're welcome to, to look that up. It will be posted, I think, on the IES website. Focusing on this step three, to anchor this discussion, I'm going to return to our exemplar case. And this is the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, or CNMI for short. Um, but what I'm going to describe here, these processes of decision making, are really something that anyone could use in any school in, in anywhere in the United States. And where I'd like to start with this is for folks to consider what you know they already have in their programs um, relevant to uh, building students' awareness and skills for careers. And so I did a quick and dirty review of the CNMI K-12 um, public school system, or PSS, and found out what they already kind of have in place. And this might not be complete, but it's it's what popped out when I was reading this. And they have a cooperative education program. And it helps students find jobs while they're in high school. And they even have job fairs. Um, they do have apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs in target industries. And as part of, I think this is really related to cooperative education, they already have that flexible work scheduling option uh, that we mentioned earlier. And so, when you take those three things into account, the idea is, OK, how can we kind of pivot from what we have? How can we enrich what we have, build on what we have? Um, I'd like to start from that. Let's, let's start where we are. And so um, they have cooperative education. They have apprenticeships. They do have some employer partners. Just do more of it. <laughs> Expand uh, and, and uh, you know, do more of what you're already doing. Um, try to find ways to incentivize students to participate more, like maybe you can negotiate some paid internships. Um, you know, um, maybe you can also find some ways to partner with uh, the community college career technical education program, uh, maybe uh, creating a dual um, enrollment kind of uh, approach or an early college approach where students will be able to get some college credit for their work experiences. Um, so that's another kind of way of expanding what they already have started uh, in um, CNMI and may be relevant to where you are, too. Um, and remember the career exploration activities and strategies that I discussed at the beginning. Um, these kinds of activities could be integrated in a couple of ways uh, in the PSS case. Um, you know, first of all, for those students who are already involved in internships, in cooperative education or tech prep, what have you, um, maybe talk about some ways that teachers in academic courses can um, participate. Uh, you know, or their mentor for the cooperative education program can become more involved in managing those activities in a way that supports internal reflection and analysis on the part of the students, like going deeper into some of these academic skills that they're applying and the social emotional competencies. Um, so like before a, a student goes into one of these programs, you know, really have that um, planning process. What do you want to achieve here? And then maybe check in and maybe have some brief reports or reflections. I mean, that's a way to kind of make it feel like, hey, I'm, I'm really doing something here. Sometimes those softer skills, it, it sort of feels like they're easy to ignore, right? And people don't really take them and think about them. But it's really, I mean, over the years, when industry talks about what they want in um, their employees, so, so often it really, you know, they feel like they can kind of train them up a lot of times with the technical skills. But that social emotional stuff is the softer stuff. Um, we do need to pay attention to it. And uh, maybe there's some ways to, to do that um, in, in, when you integrate it into your, into your program. Um, and by the way, if your school has many students who are not engaged in such programs, there are still ways to support students in career exploration. And I just wanted to mention um, you know, one program that offers a specific curriculum is called Get Focused, Stay Focused. 
Um, that's offered largely here in California where I actually am located. And um, this program involves a dedicating one semester course, usually it's an English class, in the freshman year. And it involves students completing you know, internal reflection activities, remember we talked about that earlier, as well as that external research kind of activity, documenting them, often in an online system. And then you've got your game plan and you use it to pick out the courses you want to do in high school, to think to the future of where you want to go in college, and uh, even your extracurriculars. Um, and then you can change your mind and adjust things as you learn over the years. So that's that's the get focused, um, stay focused model um, that I wanted to mention. Something else that PSS can consider is, you know, different ways to structure work experiences into the academic curriculum. And this relates to the contextualized learning approach. Um, again, teaching those basic subjects um, against a backdrop of relevant career fields. So how might you do that? Um, you might uh, be teaching a math class and through the year um, just integrate some lessons around um, the way math is applied in, from different jobs, different, kind, you know, different kinds of jobs. Or maybe um, you would be in an English class and you would be uh, highlighting a, um, you know, um, a writer uh, or an editor or somebody of that nature, and um, maybe there are different uh, parts of ELA skills that you're going to be applying in different tasks in, in one job, in that one job, and you can highlight that and have people sort of playing those roles and demonstrating they can do those things in class. Um, and there's just any time you want to focus on a special project that's a little bit like the project-based learning, um, but again, the project in your in the class could be, um, you know, representing very closely what is um, a job, a typical job task of some sort. And some other ideas here, if you want to go deeper into the contextualization approach or the problem-based learning approach, um, you may want to engage um, industry partners in a more structured way. And this is really um, something that is co-designed, like you'd one would work with um, industry partners to actually create curriculum uh, with them. And why would you want to do this, right? I mean, again, so many local industries, they do have to train folks when they come in. And they often will have existing bits of curriculum, believe it or not. And to just um, you know, get them involved, sitting with you, uh, bringing their know-how about what they need, uh, for um, incoming employees to have, have them sit in a room with educators um, to go over uh, the parts of a curriculum that seem to be promising, that um, maybe in a math class or an English class you have a few ideas, that it feels a little bit like it's approaching something career relevant, but maybe it's not quite there yet, right? So you could, I've done this with a number of folks in, um, number of industries and what I what we do when we sponsor these sessions is um, we'll recruit like maybe six um, instructor maybe yeah six instructors and like six um, industry partners or it could be three or four it doesn't have to be six but you know a few more than more than just two usually you want to get a discussion going and you'll give each you'll pair them you'll have one industry person with one educator and then you pull out like the curriculum, um, and you might have like lots of different kinds of curriculum um, that you think are promising, and then you have them kind of go through this structured rating approach that looks at, you know, relevance to the workforce skills and relevance to the academic skills, and, um, and it's a really cool way, and we've found people just generally love these discussions because they're very focused and they really bring out the creativity when you start to see what's in those lessons, you start to see how you could push them. And you can engage them in rating those uh, materials. And then what's most important is not the rating. That's just like anchoring the discussion. It's a way for people to say, this is where I stand, right? I think this is great, or I think this is not so good. And then they can talk. And that's the most important part is what they say next. And you know, they might even be um, asked to think about 
how can you integrate more computer or digital literacy? That's something industry wants. And you know, where can we fit that in our existing curriculum? Or critical and analytical skills and problem solving? Or again, those personal qualities. How can we put more teamwork in, into these lessons? How can we test their uh, you know, time management skills and self-discipline and all those sorts of things? So it's, it's a very useful and exciting way to um, get a team uh, across an educational context and a workplace context. Um, and so another idea to think about here, um, you know, in CNMI, we found that they have um, a challenge there with their geography. Um, for, it poses a real problem. They have these three little islands. And when it comes to career training, um, it's a little tougher on the two sort of two of the islands uh, that aren't, you know, where the capital is and all the many of the resources are. And so that's where I think, you know, places like CNMI as well as rural, other rural environments, um, you know, places, um, you know, think about virtual instruction. Think about ways to, um, you know, invite people in who can't always travel uh, because of cost and, and time and so forth. And, try to duplicate or recreate some of those experiences in a virtual way. And what's cool is that a lot of technical fields in particular already have free online material that educators can go through. I'll give you some resources for this later. And, um, you know, and I think also you can get your team together with teachers as well as employers. Um, and again, look at some of those videos, what have you, the virtual materials, and curate them. Think about like how you could arrange them into a sequence for the students and um, create kind of a cool set of options um, for your students. So just giving you some fodder, some ideas, and what you might see, what you might study um, if you're a researcher. And then really, when reviewing the industry partners, you may find that exploration of some high demand fields could be helped through field trips, virtual trips, job shadows. Um, and these kinds of activities may lead to opportunities to work with employers and then really gain some more hands-on access, uh, gain workspaces and equipment often the school doesn't have. Um, you know, and another interesting approach I've seen uh, that I just heard about recently is sometimes you'll be in an environment where there are lots of small businesses and startups, and they might have a shortage of um, materials and equipment and so forth. And if the school has some of that, then one thing that has been tried is inviting them into the school environment, you know, creating a place, a safe place for um, them to interact and then create some experiences where that students can maybe uh, support and then learn about these um, businesses. Um, and so that you know, would require some design and some thinking uh, to make sure it's safe and it's structured in ways that K-12 students can work um, in these spaces and receive some mentorship. So um, I want to close there and offer one more opportunity for questions and comments. So again, if there are any questions or comments, just go ahead and type those in that chat box to the right. Um, and if you come up with questions or comments after we close today, um, please do feel free to email me directly. You should all have my email um, from when we sent out the registration information. And we can uh, coordinate with Louise to get those questions answered for you. So we're going to give it just another second here. Doesn't look like anything's coming through. So, Louise, do we have resources to share on that next slide? Should we push yeah. through there while we wait to see if there are any questions? We have, I wanted to share the uh, workforce instructional materials with you. Um, I, I've done some work with the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short, and um, they have a, um, a central repository for a lot of the instructional materials that have been created across a number of different fields. Um, and uh, these are mostly STEM technician fields. Just keep that in mind. So it could be anything from welding, believe it or not, to biotech and information technology and cybersecurity. And um, it's quite a long list. And, but anyway, they have ATE Central. And you can get free instructional materials. And some of them are video-based. 
Um, also, there's ATE TV. There's actually a website um, that provides a lot of explanatory videos about a wide range of technical fields. So if you just want to even introduce your students to or just help them think about different fields they might be considering, this is a nice resource because it actually has some videos of people in those fields talking about what it's like and that sort of thing. And the other thing I wanted to mention, I mentioned the uh, Ed Visions Cooperative and Big Picture, and then also I would encourage you to look up um, Linked Learning. I didn't put that link here, but I think it's easy enough to find on Google. Um, and you can look at those websites to get some ideas of how they structure um, you know, internships and apprenticeships and career exploration activities. So that's pretty much what I had. And I know we haven't had a lot of questions this time, but I did want to thank everyone for attending and encourage you to um, do some creative things and creative research and work around career-aligned curriculum. Thank you so much, Louise, for that great presentation. And again, if there aren't any questions right now, do please feel free to forward those to me. Um, via email if you come up with any after the fact. And we'd like to thank all of you for joining us for this Rail Pacific webinar.